Hey, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage of AWS Summit. We're here in Moscone, San Francisco. We're at AWS Summit. We were just at OpenStack. Sean Douglas is here, CTO of Service Mesh. Sean, welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Great so, to have me. so we had you on at we Service Mesh. I wasn't that. there, but I watched uh, live. Uh, good show, great event, a lot of buzz. Whole different vibe here. You know, this cloud is impressive. exploding. This is really impressive this year. The uh, the just energy and the uh, the size of the event. I mean, I think they're uh, giving Oracle World a run for their money. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's only half the size, but I think next year Oracle right. World is going to be Who's the band tonight? <laughs> well, the thing is, you can breathe in here. So you know, Oracle yeah, World yeah. sometimes is a little tough to. to it's inhale. impressive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, were you now? Were you at reInvent uh, in the fall? No, you uh, weren't no. at reInvent. I don't know if you saw any of that yeah. coverage, but. Um, but really, Amazon going for it in the enterprise. Absolutely. Um, which is all good for you guys, right? The more yep. cloud, the better. So, why don't you, I mean, for the people who weren't able to see the OpenStack uh, interview, give us the, the quick rundown on, on Service Mesh, um, and, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the things we talked about OpenStack, but how they apply to AWS. And okay, maybe absolutely, do some absolutely. So, uh, Service Mesh is an enterprise cloud management platform, and we basically focus on the Enterprise 2000 and we provide a hybrid cloud management solution for enterprises that, that has very strong security governance and, and compliance features that enables you to take an application-centric view and then orchestrate the underlying infrastructure around that application across any of the public 16 cloud providers, as well as across VMware, across Microsoft, across OpenStack, and uh, do so in an application-centric way, meaning we don't spin up VMs. There's a lot of people that spin up VMs and they call that cloud management. Eh, you know, what we do is we, we accelerate the time to value uh, by actually spinning up the entire application and being able to move that around seamlessly and doing that in context of you know, governance, risk, and compliance policy in an enterprise. So, uh, you know, we really focus on big enterprise, highly regulated environments. Sorry, there's a bunch of cables around. Yeah, a lot of cables there. down there. Careful, don't stretch <laughs> yeah, your legs. Yeah, rats get all down there. wrapped up there. Sorry. <laughs> Chris was a lot taller than you the last yeah. guy. He was very talented. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're cloud agnostic. Yes, right? cloud agnostic. Um, you obviously see the trends. So where, where does cloud fit with the CIOs that you talk to? I mean. Are, are, let me ask it differently. Are, are, are IT organizations you know, finally embracing the cloud? Are they ready for the cloud? Do they have their cloud strategy act together in your view? So what we're finding is in you know, the enterprise, in, in you know, the, literally the Fortune 100 or what have you, we're finding an aggressive movement to cloud. And the, really the biggest barrier that prevented people from moving to AWS for production applications we felt was to, to have a, a have the governance in place that they can take and run those workloads and know that you know no one's going to jail for violating compliance regulations and in, in, you know if you're a financial services organization so there's there's thought leaders out there like UBS that have really embraced it and they've just really driven down the uh, the cost and uh, accelerated their time to value and, and have just you know there's a lot of people across the stack that are that are starting to do that. Um, so we're finding that I think the time is now and, and people are moving to the cloud and embracing, you know, from the service mesh perspective, we enable somebody to operate that in that type of an environment and take what may have been shadow IT or, or you know, uh, just a development out there and take incorporate that into their software development, application development lifecycle doing maybe dev in, in test on AWS and maybe they roll something into a V block on their private cloud solution and then you know through the life cycle the right place at the right time at the right cost. But I think more and more you're going to start to see that once the correct policy and governance is in place, it's not about having a private cloud or having a public cloud. It's about, it's about a cloud-based operating model and a transformation to that. So I think that really the time is now. Yeah, so I, I feel like we're in a multi-game series here. You'll have to use sports analogies. And, and there's been a number of quarters. Like the first quarter was almost, with the downturn of 2008, 2009, people said, all right, let's get to the cloud, you know, shift things to, to variable expense, and then it happened. And, and then, like you said, when things started coming back a little bit, the economy started coming back, then you had the shadow IT effect. Right. Uh, and, and now it seems as though CIOs have, are really have had an awakening and are saying, all right, let's see how we can use this for competitive advantage, a deeper business integration. Right, right, it's, <laughs> it's, it's huge. So, now, so 
where do you think we go from here? You guys are, are you're, you're talking now about this notion of hybrid, which is kind of the original vision right. that a lot of people put forth with the so-called private cloud, was this notion of control. Right. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people have, have noted that clouds like from Google or Amazon, particularly Amazon, uh, uh, and even Microsoft, there's a high degree of homogeneity. But you guys are stitching together heterogeneous clouds. That's right. So, what, so that's not trivial. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, and, yeah. and, and what are the challenges in doing that? So the way that we do, do that is we create an application-centric blueprint that can be deployed across any of the public clouds or private clouds. And now mapping the, the complexity below that and doing so in a non-lowest common de denominator way is the secret sauce, right? You have to be able to expose the value-added functionality that AWS is developing. And bring that to the surface so when you choose to deploy that blueprint to AWS, you get the best of AWS as opposed to everybody's cloud is everybody's cloud. That's that's not strategic. No partner would want to work with us. You've got to be able to enable people to, to externalize the value that they're, the additional value that they're creating. Um, one of the interesting points that you actually just mentioned was that during the downturn, people looked at cloud as a way to buy stuff by the drip and to reduce costs. If you look at how much Amazon has reduced their prices over the last you know, couple of years, you know, every time you check, they're, they're just reducing their price. And that's just, just giving massive margin compression to any of the incumbents for enterprise infrastructure as well as for enterprise software. So Amazon's push into the enterprise, I think it's really just starting to gain momentum and it empowers the CIOs to reduce their cost and then consume what they need when they need, and then when they're not using it, turn it off, right? And that's really the, the advantage of the cloud-based operating model, is to be able to spin something up on demand, not wait to procure a system for 90 days, and then deploy a VM, and then build an app. You want to be able to spin it up on demand, you know, consume it, and then shut it down when it's not being used, or shut it down at night, or reprovision, or maybe have the same shared resources that are doing VDI in the day, and then they're doing you know, big data and analytics you know, crunching at night, right? So right, it's, right. it's really interesting times. The other thing, and you've got a, a cross-platform view that, that seems very unique to it's almost like Apple. It's, it's, it's you know, we know what you need, right. uh, we're going to define the experience, we'll pull together the ecosystem of stuff that we think will help you, we're going to listen to you and involve, but it's really you know, kind of a, we've got a great solution ready to go for you versus you know, a couple weeks ago, which is, you know, here's a framework, here's bits and pieces, put it together, almost like an Android phone versus an iPhone right. versus iOS. Right. Is that, is that I think it's very read? interesting. I really like the services, like for example, Redshift. You know, AWS has put together its Redshift big data solution, and if, you know, if I was Oracle, I would be really concerned. And if they're not really concerned, then they're asleep at the wheel. Because the ability to, to, for those guys to go after data warehousing, they're not charging for data in, they're not charging for data out, they're only charging for the CPU cycles consumed. Massive opportunity for disruption, and for AWS, it's a service, right? right? So, you know, there's no, you know, nine-month enterprise sales cycle. There's no, you know, 20% uh, uh, ELA for support on top of that. It's right. just turn it on, turn it off. Right. And, you know, that enables somebody to experiment with big data and analytics right. on AWS. And guess what? Once they put the data in there, you know, what's the likelihood that they're going to move it out? Right, so it's, right. it's it, there's there's an I think that those types of services significantly advantage AWS as well as the enterprise because once you put the data there, now you can spin up a thousand VMs to, to run a load like on the, the final keynote today on the rendering farms. Where they were talking about well, they could spin up whatever you know, ten virtual machines <laughs> in seven hours right. or a thousand and do it in seven minutes. Well, the other right? thing that people I don't think give enough credit to is just the ease of purchase. Yeah. I mean, if you already have a vendor relationship, you're not even really adding no software, you're really just lighting up an extension um, of what you already have yeah. and being able to pay the same way and, and you know, there's By a, the drip is huge. There's a lot yeah. of uh, benefits to that. Yeah. And, and just one throat to choke, you know. If I can continue to get more uh, and ancillary services around the core this way, both to try and then and then hopefully to buy. It's very powerful and low friction sales model as well. So yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, please. Yeah, let's say the, the atomicity of of their mm. solution 
previously enabled you to just buy things and piece it together, but now they've also just came out with uh, ops work and cloud formation, right? Philosophically, it's very similar to actually what we're doing. We're, we're big partners, we're fans, and we, we previously looked at AWS to consume those resources and help our customers consume those resources. I mean, we do a tremendous amount of business every single month on AWS, all of our development and everything, right? But if you look at ops work, they're doing the software development lifecycle automation around an application kind of enabling DevOps story. We do the same thing for the enterprise across all these clouds, but so we fundamentally believe there's a tremendous amount of value that they're, they're creating there. And before they were doing these atomic solutions, now they've got this ops work thing that's gonna close the software development lifecycle deal. And then from the cloud formation, they have these blueprints that allow you to not just deploy an AMI, but deploy an application. Maybe in the future you'll see, I don't know, Exchange or whatever, and it'll be it'll de be deployed in that entire blueprint. Now, I mean, so we're we're partnering very aggressively right now with, with AWS, and this, but philosophically, I love the idea because that's the same thing that we do. We do it for an enterprise across all those clouds. So if we were able to map their cloud uh, formations blueprints to our blueprints. Right. And then, you know, that provides a, a, a path for people to migrate into AWS or out or wherever, right? right. So I think it's just brilliant. And this is just continuing march yeah. of power to the developer and yeah. just enabling easier and easier developer yeah, it's access exciting. resources. It's totally. Yeah. Well, and you really got a strong sense of that, I'm sure, at the OpenStack conference, right? The, yeah. the developer momentum. You know, it's interesting, we've been tracking, Sean, the OpenStack movement for a while when it first came out. John Furrier, who was very supportive of it, said, yeah. This is a long pass down the field with not a lot of time left. It's kind of a Hail Mary against Amazon. Right. And it looks like they connected that pass. But then he made a comment to me last night. He said, you know, Dave, I've been thinking about this. In many respects, OpenStack is the competitor to the traditional enterprise guys, the VMwares of the world. And because Amazon's got, you know, yeah, and there's nothing going to stop this train, right? right. I mean, Amazon's right. going and they're it's innovating higher. faster yeah. than anybody else. He made the point, they're the, they're the gorilla, but they're also the cheetah. Yeah. You know, they're the disruptor. No, you can't, I can't think of another example in the industry where that's the case. What do you think of that premise, that, that in fact, OpenStack is really as much a competition for the traditional legacy guys as they are Amazon? I think you're spot on. So I think that OpenStack is bifurcating the public, I mean, the private cloud into really VMware and OpenStack. And, and OpenStack has gotten so much, in my personal opinion, investment from HP, IBM, et cetera, et cetera, to try to get momentum around OpenStack and, and to develop this, you know, if you will, cloud-based operating system like Linux. And I think that's largely to, to enable people to, to hedge against you know, a VMware only or a Microsoft only solution. Because there's only going to be a certain number of these cloud-based operating systems, right? I think it's less about, you know, AWS, right? I think that, you know, for the private cloud, you know, for, for the public cloud, clearly AWS is, is you know, years out in front and, and are thought leaders in that space. Right, right, right. So, okay, and again, you guys don't really care. I mean, no, this, from we, your we standpoint, it's just right, go cloud. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For us, it's how do we enable the, the uh, cloud-based operating model for, for enterprises and we'll put the compliance, the uh, policy-based management and orchestration across those clouds and be able to move up or down uh, you know, and across. So. Okay, so where's this all go? I mean, it was it was sort of, you know, entrenchment into virtualization and private cloud, and it just it just feels like when you talk to organizations now, there's a lot of pressure coming both externally and internally. Externally from guys like Amazon, just innovating way faster. Cloud service providers, you know, you know, growing, uh, and then internally, CEOs, lines of business, shadow ITs. The CIO's head is in a vice. I mean, yeah. he or she has to really make a move here. They can't just virtualize or, you know, improve efficiency a little bit. They've really got to make a move here. Um, put on your, you know, break out the binoculars. What do you see over the next five years, and how do you guys exploit that? Well, I, I think it's interesting. If I, rather than looking forward for a second, let's look back first and then kind of work our way forward. Okay. So you look at virtualization. Well, what did what did you know virtualization do with VMware initially, right? It, increased the ROI and the density on the server. Now you're starting to see the same consolidation and increase in density in networking and storage. Checking out waste. Yeah, the better exactly. utilization, asset utilization. Virtualization yeah. of servers, virtualization yeah. of storage, virtualization of network. This is VMware's software-defined data center strategy. Mm -hmm. It's spot on, but it's just increasing density and ROI. 
move that forward, you, you start to see this the shadow IT thing coming. You, DevOps starts to close that loop and accelerate time to value for the applications. People start to then realize I have this public cloud I can't you know I can't get rid of and I want to get under control if I'm a, if I'm an enterprise CIO. I then I obviously need a, a hybrid solution. Well, if I need one hybrid solution, I probably want to go across multiple clouds and balance that. So you really need a strong platform that enables um, you to, to work across public cloud, private cloud, right place, right time in the life cycle, and right cost, and do everything based on policy and stay compliant and, and stay out of you know go fast and and uh, st stay out of trouble, right? <laughs> <laughs> so give us an update on the company. Where are you guys at? You know. So, uh, Fully funded. Yeah, fully funded. We raised money uh, 2011. Uh, Ignition Partners, Frank Cartelli, awesome guy. Frank Just, is a great yeah, guy. Great we firm. Love Frank, been in the queue. Super supportive, yeah. yeah. Um, we're we're on fire. We are just we can't even keep up with the business. We're we're working with all the uh, converged device players. We're working with uh, you know, a lot of the cloud service providers. Just it's coming from all angles. It's you know when when everything converges, it's 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 good. You know. <laughs> awesome. Just glad you found time to stop by exactly. the cube. Exactly. Well, you're thank busy, you for uh, having me. Busy Sean, day. always a pleasure. You know, a good friend <laughs> of the cube, yeah, Sean Douglas. Good much. to see you. All right, everybody, thank keep it right you. there. Jeff Frick and I will be back right after this word. Thank you.